Can you just briefly introduce you to uh, Dr. Edward Kantarian, <coughs> who's there? Um, Edward's uh, main interests are in theoretical philosophy, aesthetics, philosophy of social science, philosophy of religion, history of modern philosophy, including German philosophy. He completed his MA in philosophy, history, and sociology at the University of Leipzig, Germany, with a thesis on Frege and Husserl on sense and meaning, before undertaking a doctorate on the semantics of descriptive similar terms at the University of Oxford. Um, he is a philosopher trained in both the analytic and the continental traditions, and in his view, the distinction carries no normative weight. Um, um, Edward joined the department here in Kent in 2011 after spending five years at Trinity College and Jesus College at Oxford as a lecturer in philosophy. <coughs> he has three books published entitled Analytische Philosophie, Wittgenstein, Frege's Logic, um, and uh, which is very recent, 2012. Um, he has several articles published in Semantics, Frege, Kant, and other topics. His next book will be on Kant's God, to be published in 2014. The title of Edward's talk is Zedlinburg versus Kant on the Ideality of Space. Okay. On the of space. Thank you very much. You. So I'll be discussing today Trendelenburg's discussion of Kant, in particular of Kant's transcendental idealism. Um, however, I should maybe also add that I'll be mentioning a few more figures which are not very well known, such as Weichinger and uh, Kuno Fischer. Now, I myself came across Trendelenburg, like most of you, if you are Kant students, simply by coming across the famous um, neglected alternative objection, which was formulated by Trendelenburg. In fact, it was formulated by Kant's own contemporaries. And I opened up Trendelenburg's logical investigations, um, thinking I'll find there this neglected alternative spelled out in detail. I did find that, but I also discovered other arguments by Trendelenburg against Kant. Um, so what, what I'll try to do today is partly offer you a historical approach and partly a systematic one, discussing in some detail Trendelenburg's neglected alternative objection to Kant, but also then discussing the other arguments by Trendelenburg against Kant. I was able to identify five more <laughs> arguments by Trendelenburg against Kant, which are not very well known in contemporary analytic Kant studies. And in addition to that, I will then offer a few objections to Trendelenburg by Weichinger and by Kuno Fischer, and then possible replies, and actual, actual replies by Trendelenburg against this objection. So this is the structure of the talk. OK, now, first I'll introduce that's the historical part, the main figures of the debate, Kant versus Trendelenburg. I don't have to say much about Kant. We all know him. The Alastair Malmö, a very beautiful portrait of him here, my favorite one. And then Adolf Trendelenburg, on the other hand. He's, apart from being known for this neglected alternative objection, I guess, to Frege students, um, because uh, one of his essays on Leibniz, Leibniz's um, Characteristica Universalis is mentioned by Frege in the footnote to, you know, in the footnote to the preface of the Begriffsschrift of the conceptual notation, and it's probably one of the few historical pieces Frege read and which pointed Frege towards towards Leibniz's own uh, logical, formal logical endeavors. Um, I guess apart from that, Adolf Tendelbung is not very well known, so I'll just run you through some points. He was a professor in Berlin, very influential for several decades for the, in the mid-19th century, so this forgotten period, which of course our conference is much focusing on. He was much influenced by Schleiermacher's work on Plato, so in fact, to some extent, he was an idealist. He was very much taken in by Plato's theory of forms. Sometimes you come across Tendelenburg being described as a realist, but that's not very clear whether he really was that. In fact, you could say he was both a Platonist and an Aristotelian in his inaugural, uh, inaugural lecture from 1837. Uh, he's, he writes, knowledge and action must be given a unity. So we have here a unifying project which he tried to pursue 
uh, all his life. However, in contradistinction to German idealist um, attempts uh, at a unification of philosophy. He tried to renew logic, basing it on Aristotle's logic, however, also updating it insofar as it would offer us an updated uni unification of the principles of all sciences. According to his biographer, Bratuszek, um, he pursued a philosophy which is the religion of all sciences insofar as it has a purifying power and rises to the eternal or sempiternal. He, uh, he formulated several very critical objections. He was partly a histori uh, historian of, of philosophy, but partly also an analytician or, or critical uh, investigator of the history of philosophy. Some of his most well-known criticisms um, refer to Hegel. He blamed Hegel for being untrue to Plato, untrue to history, and untrue to logic. Untrue to Plato because the ideas, Plato's ideas, according to Hegel, as God's thoughts, enter the process of the world. And Trendelenburg very much disagreed with that. Also, he thought Hegel was untrue to logic insofar as the dialectic, the dialectical triadic scheme is way too schematic to really capture the complex complexities of the history of philosophy and the history of ideas or the history of mankind. And of course, Hegel was also untrue to logic, as we all know. All right, here are a few works by him. His most important one being the Log Logische Untersuchungen, Logical Investigations. It came out in three editions. This is the original place where he formulated his neglected alternative objection. Here are a few more other works by him on Aristotle's logic, critical um, essays on Hegel. Then the, the second, so he was then attacked by Kuno Fischer. Um, the, the, the neglected alternative thesis was attacked by Kuno Fischer, to which he replied in his essays, Historische Beiträge zu Philosophie, in the third volume, Über eine Lücke in Kant's Beweis von der Ausschließenden Subjektivität des Raumes und der Zeit. So, on a gap in Kant's proof for the exclusive subjectivity of space and time, a critical and anti-critical note or essay. Here you also find this essay which, Frege, which influenced Frege. He wrote other things. He wrote a book on uh, natural light, for instance. That's a, I only came across that myself. It's a 500 fat monster, so it might be worth investigating. I don't know. And then finally, after Kuno Fischer <laughs> replied to, uh, to Trendelenburg's first objection, uh, then uh, he wrote a second. He wrote actually a, a short monograph called Fischer und sein Kant. Fischer and his Kant uh, reply. OK, good, international rights. You see, these figures, all these figures in this time, they were all complete philosophers. And I think we should understand ourselves in this way, to uh, not just focus <coughs> on one philosopher and one topic for the rest of our lives. OK, good. Now, uh, another protagonist I shall discuss was Kuno Fischer. Here he is, looking a bit grumpy. He was uh, a professor of philosophy and German literature in Heidelberg. He was a very, very influential historian of modern philosophy and a major Kant interpreter. He was one of the main initiators of this back to Kant uh, movement. He wrote on aesthetics, uh, books on aesthetics, on Schiller. Uh, he wrote a, a book on the genesis and morphology of jokes, although he doesn't look very funny here. Uh, however, however, apparently, he was one of the most amazing lecturers, German, German, German philosophy lecturers in the 19th century. He had the, in bold the three contributions uh, or three, three publications where he attacked Trendelenburg, where you find his discussion with Trendelenburg. And then finally, I mentioned Hans Weichinger. He was a professor at Halle. He's a very influential commentator of Kant's critique of pure reason. His own philosophy can be described as a mixture between pragmatism and uh, instrumentalism based on a theory of fictions with reference to Nietzsche. So it, it bases it, it itself on Nietzsche. This might be very interesting for those among you who are, who are uh, students of, of Nietzsche. I don't, I'm not sure, however, whether it's translated. So he's also well known for his for his found, founding uh, the Kant studies, Kant, Kant Studien, uh, which uh, gave rise to, uh, to, to renaissance in, in, in studying Kant. And um, his commentary on Kant's critique of pure reason, which is his, 
his uh, masterwork cons only managed, well, to co cover the aesthetic, the prefaces, the introduction, and the aesthetic of the critique of pure reason. Then he, he went blind, so he only managed a thousand pages on the first hundred <laughs> pages of the critique of pure reason. The other 500 he didn't manage, uh, but he did manage to discuss every single sentence within this first hundred pages of the critique of pure reason. It's, it's a fantastic book. I mean, I've read bits of it. It's, it's really incredible scholarship. Okay, now, the Strandellenburg uh, Fischer controversy, I mentioned already the publications in which they exchanged with each other, but there are many, many other contribu contributors to it, Hermann Cohen, Lotze, Weihinger, and many, many others. According to the historian of uh, Neo-Kantianism, or one of the leading historians of Neo-Kantianism, Könke, it was the most significant and prominent debate, philosophical debate of the 19th century. In fact, it reached other countries too, like England through Edward Craig, who contributed live, as it were, to the debate, but also Italy and other countries. It ended with Trondelenburg's pr premature death, so Kuno Fischer had the last word during the, the debate. Um, and uh, there was no real consensus. I, I counted the, the contributions in favor of Fischer and Trondelenburg, and they're equal, and there is a third, a neglected alternative, those who think that neither Fischer nor Trondelenburg are correct. Good, so Weichinger, however, wrote around 20 years later in this commentary on uh, Kant's Critique of Pure Reason that essentially Trondelenburg is correct. Now, what is this issue, the issue, the main philosophical bone of contention of this discussion? Well, the question is, what is space and time? But I'll just, for simplicity's sake, refer mostly to space. Is space something which belongs to things in themselves or only to appearances? Is space something noumenal, whether a, a noumenal entity, a noumenal <coughs> property, or a noumenal relation? Or is it a mere form of our sensory representation of things? And I think already here we need to make a note, namely there are two versions, two readings, of this problem or of this question. One is an ontological reading of it, which is to say things in themselves on Kant's uh, doctrine are not spatial. So it's really a statement about the nature of things themselves. They are not spatial. And the epistemological reading of, of Kant's doctrine is to say, no, 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 we, only ha ha we don't have any knowledge whether or not uh, noumena, things in themselves, are spatial. They may well be spatial, whether in our terms or in, or in, in, some, other, in some other forms, but we simply can't tell. These two distinctions are very important and uh, need to really be made. Now, I'll run you first through Kant's own argument in favor of transcendental idealism. I hope most of it is familiar, vaguely at least, in the metaphysical exposition, he gives us four supposed proofs. The first one argues that all external experience presupposes the idea of space. So in order to even be able to experience something external, I have to, as it were, first have the idea of space and then I place the objects in that space. So space in that sense is prior to any possible empirical experience. Hence, space is a priori. The second proof argues that one can think of all empirical objects as being absent, but we cannot think of space also being absent. I can take each of you out of this room, then the chairs and the tables, the room itself, can't everything. I can do that, but then I'll still be left over with space itself. I cannot take space away itself. Hence, space is a necessary idea. Thirdly, he argues space is a, is a continuous unit, a continuum, which has no parts, no, no independent actual parts. You can't take bits away from space. Rather, it has divisions which we put into space. We divide up, as it were, space into bits, like you have a, um, yes, a sheet of paper and you just draw lines. That's the only kind of parts or other divisions space has. Hence, space Space cannot be a concept, but must be an intuition. And fourthly, space contains infinitely many possible ideas, 
but not as subordinated. These ideas of space are not subordinated to space. If they were subordinated to space, then space would be conceptual because subordination is the relation in which a concept stands to the objects um, falling under it. But that's not true of space. Rather, space consists of infinitely many possible representational ideas, Vorstellungen, and uh, being so, it cannot be again, yet he establishes a concept but, but must be an intuition. Hence, the overall conclusion is, th is that space is a necessary a priori intuition. From this, in the transcendental exposition, which just comes after the metaphysical exposition, he, and uh, subsequent parts of the aesthetic, he draws or makes first several connected points and then draws a conclusion. He makes the point that we have this very famous uh, the point about geometry. We do have apodictic spatial knowledge of objects, namely in geometry, but it's apodictic, insofar as it is apodictic knowledge, it cannot stem from experience. This kind of a priori necessary knowledge we have of the objects of our experience in advance of, of our experience cannot be um, is pure. The first point he makes. The second one is knowledge of things in themselves um, is impossible to intuit prior to their existence. We cannot have noumena, knowledge of noumena prior, as it were, to being acquainted with them. How could that be? That would be an amazing, amazing feat. Further, nothing remains of space if we abstract from our subjective conditions of experience. I'm not sure whether that's an independent point or just a corollary of what he has said so far. I'm also not sure how valid this point is. Not sure how we could abstract from our subjective conditions of experience. No, uh, whether that's even intelligible. Why couldn't there be essentially perceivable Numenal objects out there. I've never understood this point in Kant. Okay. Uh, intuition, then the next point, intuition gives us only knowledge of relations, Verhältnisse, of objects to each other and to us. It doesn't give us any knowledge of things in themselves as they are in themselves. It's very important. And then finally, pure intuition contains only relations. It is the a priori form of empirical intuition. From all this, he follows. Uh, or infers the exclusivity claim, namely that space is only objective, a necessary a priori form of our receptivity. It's, space is nothing which attaches to things as they are in themselves. It's really just our manner of, of coming to know, to know things. It's an unchance form. Um, okay, now, further on, he draws... Okay, this is just actually now summarizing his point. In B42, space is nothing but a form of all appearances of outer sense. It is the subjective condition of sensibility under which alone outer intuition is possible to us. In addition to that, solely from the human standpoint, we can speak of space, of extended things, etc. If we depart from the subjective condition of outer intuition, the idea of space stands for nothing whatsoever. This seems to be the ontological version of transcendental idealisms. There is no such thing as space um, in the realm of, of noumena. But we have also B59, in which he seems to be arguing in favor of an epistemological version of transcendental idealism. What objects may be in themselves, and apart from all this receptivity of our sensibility, remains completely unknown to us. We know nothing but our mode of perceiving them, a mode which is peculiar to us and not necessarily shared in by every being, though certainly shared by every human being. With this alone, have we any concern? Space and time are its pure forms. This does sound as if there may be something like space, at least, something equivalent to space out there in the realm of noumena. It's just that we have no clue whatsoever about it. We cannot uh, know it. Okay, so this brings us to uh, his famous statement of transcendental idealism in B44. Our exposition therefore establishes the reality that is the objective validity of space in respect of whatever can be presented to us outwardly as object, but also at the same time the ideality of space in respect of things when they are considered in themselves through reason that is 
without regard to the constitution of our sensibility. So this was this abstraction uh, stuff I mentioned before. We assert then the empirical reality of space, namely with reference to, to uh, outer experience, to phenomena, to appearances, and yet at the same time we assert its transcendental ideality. It is nothing apart from the conditions of the possibility of experience. Now this might really disappoint you if you are a metaphysician because you might think, well, if space is really just subjective, is, this not, is it not a form of illusion? But in B69, he argues appearances are appearances of something, of something real, of something really given, an object or thing. But since its properties depend on our subjective manner of intuition, the object as appearance must be distinguished from the object as thing in itself. He makes here a distinction between the thing as it is considered as an object of experience as it, and it is, as it is considered in itself. And given that we can make this distinction, even so we only have phenomenal knowledge of the thing and not knowledge of it how it, as it is in itself, it doesn't follow from that that we have our knowledge is illusion, our cognition is illusion. It is based on something real which is out there. And here is a nice quotation from the prolegomena. There are things given to us as external objects, but we know nothing about what they may be in themselves, but know only their appearance. In other words, the idea which cause, sorry, the idea which they, uh, these external objects, cause in us by affecting our senses. Now, discussing now Trendelenburg's neglected alternative. As I said, this is the first of six possible objections by Trendelenburg against Kant. Um, Trendelenburg grants that space is a necessary and a priori form of intuition, but he thinks that this does not entail the exclusive ideality or subjectivity of space. After all, that we don't have just two options, namely that space is subjective or that space is objective, we have a third option. And that option is that space is both objective and subjective, the famous third option or neglected alternative. And Trendelenburg claims Kant has neglected this third option. His own conclusion to transcendental idealism is based on the neglection of this third option, and hence it's not valid. Now, Trendelenburg runs us through the four arguments in uh, Kant's metaphysical exposition, step by step. I can only really do it very briefly. First, he says, yes, OK, we grant Kant that space is a priori. But why does it follow from that that it cannot also be objective? Second, OK, fair enough, space is necessary. But, quote, might it not be necessary for the mind precisely because it is necessary for objects? Third, OK, space is a continuous unit. But surely this is based on the rapport between external objects. This very insight is based on the rapport between external objects, only then to deny uh, space external reality. In other words, Kant's third argument in the metaphysical exposition is parasitic on our external perception. He turns it exactly the other way around, turned down and borrow. And fourth, again, a parasitic argument. Uh, space, OK, according to Kant, is infinite. It doesn't have subordinated parts. Hence, it is an intuition and immediately given. But this, again, is based on the rapport between external objects. We, 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 have, we, taking, we are taking it for granted, this extremely basic relation we have with the world as it is in itself. Uh, and then we abstract from this relation. Kant abstracts from this relation um, in an illicit manner. Since these four points are the premises of Kant's exclusiv exclusivity claim, the claim is established only by ignoring the third option, according to Trendelenburg. Now I'll move on to um, the second possible argument by Trendelenburg against Kant. Namely, he claims against Kant, subjectivity does approach illusion or can be assimilated to illusion. Kant argues that uh, a shining appearance is not shine, is not illusion, because appearances are causes of real things in us, as I have explained already. However, 
in order to do that, he has to speak about causes of real things. And Trent Rellenberg immediately jumps in and says, no, 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 that's illicit. Because cause and effect, as we know from the analytic, cannot be applied to appearances. I'm very sorry. Hence, your, you can't, your, your supposed connection between uh, appearances and the noumena be behind them is no connection at all. We can't have that kind of connection. Hence, uh, cognition approaches illusion. In the prolegomena, Kant writes, just as the sensation of red has no similarity to the property of cinnabar, which causes this sensation in me, so it does not make sense to say my idea of space is similar to the object. Tandellenburg replies to that, but surely space and time are much more general and much more fundamental than colors. For if objects are not, okay, if they don't have colors, maybe we can live without that if we are not poets, I don't know. But um, if objects are not even spatial and temporal, then there is no ontic ground of our knowledge at all. And, quote, we cannot, get, we cannot rid ourselves of the worry that illusion has a hand in experience. What is it knowledge of that we are supposed to have? Good. Um, okay. Here is a quotation by Tondelenburg showing that in all cognition, we want the thing itself, not us. Hegel says something similar, by the way. According to Kant, we search for things, but succeed only in capturing ourselves. The modesty of the critical doctrine has been praised, but this is a modesty which reduces science to beggary. OK, the third argument by Trondellenburg against Kant, the contingency of mathematics. If we assume that space is a mere subjective form, then, so says Dellenburg, we have no certainty of its applicability to things. No certainty. For, for us, space has these properties, we could say, but for other creatures, for other vessels, it might have other properties. Nothing, seems, nothing in Kant seems, seems to be denying this. So then we could argue, well, if even other creatures could have a different uh, spatial form, why shouldn't our uh, intuition of space also change at some point? What speaks against the necessity of intuition in this respect? It's all based on a thought experiment anyway, the very first argument in the metaphysical experience, right? I, uh, sorry, the, the, uh, the second argument. I asked you to think of all objects being taken out of space um, bit by bit. If we do this type of experiment, what tells us that we all will agree about the result of the experiment? Trendelleborg therefore argues that this possibility, namely that the, f the form of special intuition might, after all, change, if there is a possible possibility of contingency claimed here, that this possibility is part and parcel of Kant's theory. But then all conquests of mathematics, the laws to which it, is it, it subjects things, the orbits of celestial objects, okay, all the Newtonian mechanics, will be mere fantasies of our intuition, utter disaster. Okay, next argument by Trendelenburg, the fourth one, also relating to mathematics. This one deals with the applicability of mathematics. Um, this point we can take for granted, it's in, it's in Kant. Appearances emerge out of the interplay of noumenal affection on the one hand, our forms of intuition and the intellect, Verstand. Those two things, those three things together give us appearances and then experience. For Kant, of course, mathematics is then valid for appearances. However, Trondellenburg then says, the other half of appearances, things in themselves, are then surely not captured by mathematics. It only applies to appearances. But surely then, applied mathematics is the application of pure a priori forms, like in geometry, to the given, to the noumenal. There is this extra element. We don't have just pure mathematics and then applied mathematics. We have pure mathematics, and then in applied mathematics, we have this extra element, reality, right? To what else are we applying our pure mathematics? Hence, Trendelenburg concludes, this applicability must surely tell us something about things in themselves. Here's a very nice quotation. By becoming appearances, things fall under the laws of space and time, and by falling into the molds of space and time, 
This must be because their nature allows them so, their nature. It would not be intelligible that things enter a communion with space and time if they, things, did not somehow partake in space and time. How is it possible that noumena are susceptible to be objects of, our, for, uh, of application of our forms of intuition? The fifth argument, the famous problem of motion already found in, uh, in, in Kant's uh, contemporaries, uh, Lambert, Zulze, Schulz, Mendelssohn, and so, and so on. The question here is about motion itself. Where does it come from? It seems to be that motion itself, or change in, in Lambert, um, a letter from 1770, change itself is at least as elementary as space and time. It cannot be constructed out of space and time. You cannot reduce, analyze, as it were, motion in terms of space and time al alone. Why not? Because space and time, especially space, it's, it's a rigid form. It's there. You can't get from space, from geometry to dynamics simply. Uh, there, is, there is something mis missing here. And in fact, Kant tells us slightly contradictory things. I'm not sure whether it's really contradictory, but I'll present it the way Tandelbaum presents it. Uh, namely, in A41, Kant tells us that motion as a determination of an empirical object out there presupposes space. But space is, of course, not itself movable. Hence, motion is only known through external experience, OK? So motion presupposes space. But then, later on, uh, in the transcendental deduction, he tells us the following. Motion as description of pure space, or not of empirical objects, is a priori. We can't think the dimensions of space without setting three lines at right angles to one another from the same point. Yeah? Try to do that. Try to think the three-dimensionality of space in any other way. And in fact, Kant adds to that even a more amazing claim, we can't think even time without attending to the synthesis of the manifold in drawing a line. I should have made drawing italics. So on this, in, according to this second passage, space and time presuppose motion. It's exactly the other way around. OK. And Trendelenburg picks up this uh, passage from Kant to then lead on to his own positive account of space, saying, indeed, this thought leads beyond Kant, for motion turns out to be something more elementary than space and time. Nowhere has Kant explained how the ready-made forms of space and time combine to produce motion. And the final argument this is very quick. It seems that these ready-made forms of intuition are somehow a miracle. We cannot give any account of them. They are, after all, rigid forms. And then the question is, where do they come from? Have they fallen from the sky? Can we give some genetical account of them? How is it possible that infinite space and time rest in us? Trendelbaum thinks this is an utter miracle. Why are there only these two forms? Could there not be more of such forms? In what sense are they sufficient? OK, um, now, these were the six objections against Kant. We'll be running out of time, I already see. Also, OK, I try my best. Otherwise, Christine will be. Um, good. Now, I'll try to just sketch very briefly Trent Allenburg's own positive account of space. So, because we only have, we only know him as a critic uh, of, of Kant, but in fact, he has his own positive account. This positive account occurs in chapter five of the Logische uh, Untersuchungen. It's called Die Bewegung, that chapter, motion. And it occurs before his criticism of Kant. So. Uh, that's, that's the way he proceeds here. He tells us the following. The common origin of space and time is motion. Physical objects and pure intuitions both develop out of motion. Okay, Space and time are not ready-made forms, or else they would be contingent, as I've already pointed out. And in fact, even pure thought is imbued with spatial structure, is, is penetrated by, by, spa, by spatial structure. <coughs> because we say things like we are connecting and separating concepts. Well, how are we doing that? OK, remember, this is actually, we are speaking here about an account of logic before Frege and Husserl. So it's quite psychologistic. So these guys really thought we are connecting concepts and separating them. 
and that seems to involve some, some sort of space. Here's a very nice quotation. Uh, where the logical intellect infers, for instance, in the syllogism, it deals with subordinated, supraordinated, and coordinated concepts. The very spatial names of these concepts already suggest a setup in the space of thought, which only motion creates. Okay, you can also see this uh, just as a footnote. Of course, this also kills off Hegel's logic, because if you look at uh, Hegel's logic right at the beginning, um, he makes the transition from, from being to nothingness, from Sein to Nichts, and according to Trandelle book, that re relies on real motion. He's, Hegel is doing hocus pocus there, really, when he thinks he's doing a tra transition. It's, really, it's not at all a pure transition. It's not a transition in the pure, pure domain. It's a transition which is parasitic. The very possibility of conceiving Hegel's argument is parasitic on real motion, on our concept of real motion. Hence, um, this argument by Trendelenburg kills two flies with one sweat, both Kant and Hegel. And I should also mention that Trendelenburg's own positive theory of space is not a pre-established harmony, as it's often thought, but it's actually a correspondence between core natural things, mind and world. Here is an, a nice uh, way of presenting this. In intuition, thinking steps out of itself through motion. To look at the mountain, one's gaze must circumscribe it, construct it. The mountain rises. Such expressions point to motion in intuition. If I want to imagine a mountain without perception, I must construct it in the space of the thought. And I do this through the motion of my inner gaze. Okay, I don't know whether I have a time at all for Weichinger and Kuno Fischer. Do you want to hear? I'll wrap, it. I'll, I'll wrap it up. Okay, very quickly. Um, Weichinger's just one. Weichinger doesn't have very many objections against him, but he's, th this is the most important one. He thinks that, um, he thinks that essentially that uh, Trendelenburg has committed a logical fallacy for objective really means real uh, in, uh, in Trendelle book's argument, and subjective means non-real. After all, we are talking here all the time about the validity or ontological reality of space. And in these terms, objective just means real and subjective means non-real. Hence, if we rephrase Trendelle book's neglected alternative, <coughs> we just have space is non-real and real at the same time, and that's simply a logical contradiction. And now Weichinger comes to the rescue of Trendelenburg and says what Trendelenburg should have said. He should have made a distinction between the origin of the idea of space and its ontological validity. In other words, he should have, Trendelenburg should have neg uh, reformulated the neglected alternative in this way. Concerning its validity, space is objective. Concerning its origin as an idea, space is subjective. And on this reading of the neglected alternative, the alternative, the doctrine is correct. Uh, Trendelenburg's criticism of, of uh, Kant is indeed correct. Now we can reply here on Trendelenburg's behalf. Trendelenburg didn't do it himself, he was already dead. Trendelenburg makes exactly the Weichinger's point, uh, namely in his first reply to Fischer. I don't have to mention it, here's just a quotation, but he makes exactly the same point. He makes uh, this vital distinction between uh, the, or the origin of, of space as an idea and the validity of space. And he thinks the validity of space is noumenal. The origin of space, of course, as an idea is a priori. Now, Kuno Fischer, Kuno Fischer came also to the rescue of Kant. I just give you two arguments and that's it. Um, Kuno Fischer disagrees with Trondelenburg. He thinks Kant has considered the neglected alternative, in fact, in two versions. In the first version, space is transcendentally subjective and objective, and that Kant has refuted. It has been proven wrong in the transcendental aesthetic, for space is a mere a priori form. Hence, how can it be noumenal? If it's a form, it cannot be also noumenal. It's a subjective form. And of course, if you want to prove something wrong, you must consider it first, and that's exactly what Kant did. And the second version of the supposedly neglected alternative, Kant did consider Namely, that space is transcendentally subjective, 
and empirical objective. In fact, that's not at all a neglected alternative. It's just Kant's doctrine. OK, Trendelenburg's reply is no, he hasn't. <laughs> Kant hasn't really considered uh, the neglected alternative. Kant pursues two strategies. First, he shows either he shows that space and time are a priori unnecessary, from which he infers to their subjectivity or ideality, or Kant assumes the nominality of space and time and then shows that this contradicts their a priority and necessity. And Tendelenburg says, in both these arguments, he is relying on a tacit premise, namely that the a priori and necessity of space and time are incompatible with nominality. And Kant has nowhere proven this tacit premise. OK, this is just giving you uh, the schematic version of it. Not necessary, it's repetitive. Then the second argument by Kuno Fischer against Trendelenburg. Trendelenburg also falls prey to an ambiguity about the term, the notion reality, and the term objectivity. Trendelenburg confuses transcendental reality with empirical reality. He hasn't read Kant, essentially. <laughs> He's ignorant of Kant's text. The subjectivity of space, according to Fischer and Kant, does not include all reality. We know that, but it includes transcendental reality. And the subjectivity of space is compatible with empirical reality or objectivity. Once we disambiguate um, this term, these two terms, reality and objectivity, the neglected alternative is not an objection to Kant at all, but his very doctrine, Fischer concludes. To which, finally, Trendelenburg's <laughs> reply, I have done my homework. This is in his last, uh, second reply to, to uh, Fisher. If the exclusive subjectivity of space and time are proven, then Kant's empirical objectivity will ensue the application of space and time to the appearances as conditioned merely through our forms of intuition, but not the validity of space and time of the things in themselves. What? Kant also calls transcendental reality. So therefore, Trendelenburg concludes the ambigu Fischer's ambiguity objection is pointless. And also Weichinger concludes the same thing of, after a very long discussion. The neglected alternative cannot be diffused, uh, the, sorry, the neglected alternative objection cannot be diffused by glossing objectivity as empirical objectivity as opposed to transcendental objectivity. Uh, the empirical objectivity of space is supposed to be established by the exclusive objectivity of space, not vice versa. So you can't just come along and tell me, well, I have, you have neglected this term in, in, in Kant's works, empirical objectivity. That notion, empirical objectivity, is a notion which makes sense within Kant's doctrine of transcendental idealism. And the former cannot be employed to prove the, la the latter. Terminologies don't prove anything. The morale? Trendelenburg's criticism of Kant does not rest solely on the neglected alternative. The neglected alternative is more complex that's, than sometimes understood. Trendelenburg has a good grasp of Kant's theory. His criticism of Kant is embedded in a comprehensive metaphysical system. The positions in the general debate of this time are more intricate than it is often presented. The texts are richer than standard summaries suggest. Hence, back to the 19th century. <laughs> okay, and here's the answer. for those of us who are deep into um, cancer text. Um, and uh, I'd like now to take some questions from, from you. Um, just remind me of your name. Oh, Rob. Rob. Rob and um, what's the question? Yes? Yes, please, sorry. I was, I was quite interested and puzzled by this idea that uh, the perception of time sort of presupposing the perception of motion, mm. especially given the example or the, the reference to the bit about drawing a line in thought. Mm -hmm. Because it seems to me that that's a representation of growth, not motion. It's the lines growing across the page. And the mountain rises in the sense that it's sort of built up from the ground. The mountain's not being lifted up. 
So I was wondering, uh, and the thought seems, I don't know whether the thought is less persuasive if you think of it being the representation of uh, time involves the representation of the growth, because that seems to be what's going on. I'm not supposed to imagine the pencil mm. moving across the page. So I was wondering, maybe I've misunderstood the point. Oh, I, was what uh, I don't know, thing. maybe I'm misunderstanding you. Um, how is growth so different from motion, or doesn't growth involve? I mean, growth is just uh, an additional, adds just an additional complexity, isn't it? To yes, get to growth. There's no entity that's occupying, at one point occupies one part of space, and then yeah. the next moment occupies a different moment of space. Well, I don't know about it. I mean, we would have to ask Kant here how he thought that motion is involved in the pure drawing of the line in our minds. So well, that's, that's a way, good point, yeah. The confusion is involved in, yeah. uh, in the objection. The assumption is that the drawing has to be a motion. It's not clear to me that that's true. Well, it could be, well, synthesis. I, I'm not sure, yeah. Could be some sort of motion. Yeah. Pure motion, abstract it's motion. It's certainly true that I might represent one thing one moment. Yeah. Move on to yes. another. Yes. But that seems to be different from the representation of a, of a movement. Well, he makes, Kant makes the distinction between motion of real object, right? Mm. And that in pure space, but he uses the same term in both cases. So Trendelenburg is here just playing with what Kant has offered him. Mm. <laughs> May I suggest that perhaps the next question is mine? Thank you, thank you. It's, I'll think about it, yes. I mean, this, um, <coughs> la, <coughs> no. The next question is my brings up. Okay, the sorry, yes. Okay. Okay. So next we have Vasilis. Well, it was in some news at the beginning, sort of by the by, you said you, were, you, you weren't sure why he turned to the better than was, was characterized as a realist. But I've always understood him as a, as a realist, as, mm -hmm. a, as a transcendental realist. And that's, in fact, if mm -hmm. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, how he sees himself. And, when, and, uh, and he sees himself as a, as a transcendental realist following Aristotle. Of course, Aristotle, not Aristotle, but Trendelenburg was a famous Aristotle scholar who was a, a commentary on the categories. Now, transcendental realism is, is the view that, if it means anything, it's something like uh, things in thought or sensibility are thus and so because they're thus and so in reality. So the transcendental element is the because, but, but he has no fear of this, or, or, or of the because going in that direction rather than, of course, the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. idealism. I I also tend or tended to read him as a as a realist. It's just that I I don't know his work very well, his overall work very well. But I just came across various passages where he says, in the end, we're reality, but it's a reality. The task of philosophy is to unveil God's thoughts in reality. And these are Plato's ideas in the end. So he thinks that reality participates in some sort, in some form, uh, in Plato's forms. And so on one, on the one, from one point of view, he seems to be transcendental realist, as you point out. But how that exactly relates to his Platonist background, I'm, I'm not so sure. I'm quite puzzled about it. Maybe we should dedicate a whole conference to transcendental. <laughs> Maybe in the future. Okay, thanks for the question, Vasilis, and thanks for the answer. And then if you can, the next question will bring more to that debate. So next is Dr. Kelly Grafke. Grafke, sorry. Um, actually, it relates to what was just brought up in the uh, previous question, because mm -hmm. I was wondering, in Trendelenburg's uh, desire to go back, in some sense, to Aristotle, um, what you could say then about the task of philosophy as he conceives of it and what went wrong specifically. Um, because I've always, I have this vague intuition that this period in German philosophy is sort of a rehearsal for Heidegger. It's a what? A rehearsal for Heidegger in some mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that this problem of the origins of philosophy and the task of philosophy is getting played out and discussed in this problem that you describe. Mm. And thank you very much for that. Yes, sure. I don't. Is it a rehearsal for Heidegger? That's a very teleological <laughs> approach to the period. 
Well, Heidegger himself, if you look at his logic, yes. is, is very intrigued with this period. Yes. But he feels that the problem hasn't been stated, I think, adequately. Mm. But I'm, I'm wondering... Yes, it's hard, it's hard to say, yes. What um, the task of philosophy is for Trondelenburg. Well, I, I take it in the end. I think it's a service to God in the end. I mean, in that respect, he is like the German idealist, I mean, like all these people. Prior to the to the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, most of these people were obsessed with with religion and with theological ideas and had an underlying uh, religious belief. So, um, I've come across recently. Um, a book by, by a German expert on Hölderlin and Hegel, who shows the tremendous influence he Hölderlin had on Hegel, both being part of the Tübinger Stift together with Schelling, and they were, they were saturated with, no, with knowledge and with readings, not just of Kant and of Fichte and Reinhold, but also with the Platonist tradition and the theological Platonist tradition of the time of the Protestant context, the milieu in which they are raised. And um, so we might have to, to change our Anglo-Saxon perspective on the rise of German idealism a lot. Different lenses. Yes, perhaps. yeah. And finally, thanks for questions. But I'm sorry, I, I don't know how to, to, to answer this. Uh, Nor do I. Yeah. <laughs> We'd have to look at, at Heidegger's lectures on on uh, on Kant and see whether there are similar similar ideas here. Yeah. Okay. okay. And finally, Daniel. Oh, I'm so sorry. Is, so that, I, um, uh, is it a continuation of your? Well, it well it's just I, I just wanted I didn't follow the uh, the reductio of, of Hegel's deduction from uh, nothingness from being. Uh, Trendelenburg had a reductio of that. Is that, is that correct? Sorry, uh, the, the, yeah. The, the um, Trendelenburg's attack on Hegel's yes. logic is deduction of nothing, uh, Hegel's deduction of nothing from being. Yes. But the, you, you linked it up with the idea of thought as motion. Well, I don't, he does, yes. Maybe it was not yeah, I just, no, He I just, just, just thinks that there is a transition here. There is a transition from being to, to nothing. What is and that, that, that tra transition, Trendelenburg thinks, is parasitic on our understanding of motion. And motion is something real in the world. It's not something in the pure abstract realm of Hegelian logic. But, yeah. but Hegel's... I don't know whether that's fair. I mean, so. Hegel is absolutely uh, besotted with the idea of motion, isn't he? Uh, I, mean, I don't know. I mean, I yes, but Trendelenburg thinks that his concept of motion mm -hmm. is the motion that happens in the external world, in physical, in yeah. physical, I don't know. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a good point, because I think that's you're a good right. Point, yeah. I mean, it's the whole, the whole idea of it in Hegel's philosophy. I mean, the, the notion of motion, of course, having wrapped in metaphysical considerations, this is there. Good point. Mm. Thank you. And, and finally, Daniel. Is there time to ask the question? Um, if you think you can ask Edward the question over the lunch, then I would, uh, I would say, uh, no, why not? No, we'll have it later, that's yeah? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay. Right, so um, our next speaker. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.